muscle cell or a nerve cell. Now I'm running out of t-shirts here, so I'll have to give a rain check on those where I don't get to them. Yes, here? Um, I was wondering if there's any, um, like, any way that stem cells could be used to treat degenerative diseases caused by prions. Like, because I read in an article that Parkinson's might actually be caused by a prion, prion not um, anything else. Uh, that's a great question. It's not my field, and I don't know a lot about it. But I would say that if there are cells which are defective for whatever reason, prion changes in conformation and then a dysfunctional cell, I think it's perfectly reasonable to imagine that one could make that kind of missing cell and use it for replacement. Now, in, in some cases, like in Parkinson's, it may well be possible to do it because it seems one of the principal or most important functions of the missing neurons are to make dopamine. But in other cases, like in Alzheimer's, where it's the neural connections over the history of the animal that give rise to memory and cognition, it's much less likely. There, I think, it's this second program I talked about, looking for drugs that would slow degeneration, which is more likely to give benefit in the shorter term. Okay, and let's go back to this side here. I was wondering, when you were talking about the um, signals that make a cell differentiate, what you just said too, is it really like that few or are there a lot more? The, the, the signals that tell a cell what to become, uh, determine its fate, are really this, one of the sort of hottest areas of modern biology is to try to figure out what factors are in the cytoplasm, these transcription factors, which go and rearrange the chromatin and set uh, the sort of whole orchestra in play for all of early development. You're asking me how many of those signals are there. What one can say now is that in terms of the signals that come from outside the cell, what I called growth factors, those are members of families of proteins. There are only about 10 families, maybe about 100 signals in total. And now the challenge for scientists is to figure out how are they mixed and matched to give rise to all these different kinds of cells. One example I sometimes use is that when you go to a Chinese restaurant, you have a menu of hundreds of items. But if you were going to the kitchen, you might only find six or seven pots. It's the way they're mixed and matched to make all these different dishes. Similarly, the mixing and matching of the time and the concentration of those signals can give rise to all these different kinds of cells. Now, that's my last t-shirt, but I'll promise to get one for uh, other questions. Do we have a question here? Um, <clears throat> earlier, you discussed um, how you injected um, one of the motor neurons from a mouse into a chicken. And yesterday, you had said that it was like possibly harmful or it could cause rejection to move the cells from different animals. So how is it that in this case, nothing was... Right. I'm, glad, I'm glad you caught that little uh, discrepancy. The, the trick here, the difference is that the mouse cells were put into a chick embryo before the chick's own immune system had developed. So one suspects that as the chick was growing and its immune system was surveying what's around, saying what is self and what is not self, it didn't recognize the mouse cells as being not self. It recognized it as self. So yesterday's experiment that Nadia was talking about pertained to transplantation in an animal with a fully functioning immune system. I'm, I'm also glad you asked the question, though, because in all of the procedures I talked about today, I've pretty much ignored the problem of immune rejection. Even if what I've said today were successful for transplanting cells, it would require given our present state of knowledge, some kind of immunosuppressant to be moving cells from one kind of patient to another, unless we made patient-specific ES cells for everybody. Yes, in the green. Um, I understand how you would develop patient-specific cells and then possibly inject them into an embryo, but how, if you develop patient-specific cells, how would you inject it into um, an adult person who had the disease, would you inject it right to the site and expect the cells to start dividing and re, like, regenerate that, those missing cells? Right, so it's a good question and of course the answer is going to be complicated because it depends on which disease we're thinking about. In the case of diabetes, it's already known that one can transplant islets from a cadaver into the liver of a patient and that they will function for a year or more. That's obviously not what one would do with a motor neuron to treat ALS. You don't want your motor neurons in your liver, right? So for each disease, there would be a different kinds of transplantation. 
And I'd say the cases where this field is farthest along is transplanting the dopamine producing cells, the neurons, into the midbrain for Parkinson's and for pancreatic beta cells for diabetes. A question here. Are there any type of degenerative diseases that attack two types of cells instead of just one? I think uh, the answer is certainly going to be yes, but we don't know so much about the progression of all of these diseases. The reason I guess it's going to be yes is that once one of the cells in your body starts to screw up, all of the cells are constantly interacting. So the adjacent blood vessels or other tissues are likely to degenerate at the same time. This has been a special problem in the nervous system to try to figure out when neurons degenerate. Is it because the supporting cells, like the glial cells, are really the ones that have the defect and aren't providing enough support or nourishment? Or is the neuron gone wrong, and then when it's not healthy, its adjacent cells fall apart? We have time for one more question. Let's go over here for our last question. I was just wondering if this process of reprogramming nuclei could maybe one day be used to treat or reverse um, some of like the oncogenic mutations that ultimately lead to cancer, or if the two are just completely unrelated? No, I, th I think they are related in the following way. If a cancer cell appears, one wants to figure out how one could kill it is the sort of first thing to think about. But it may, in the end, be easier in some cases to reprogram it to tell it not to be causing so much trouble. The reprogramming at the first instance could be to tell it not to divide or it could tell it to stop dividing and differentiate. And so this problem of how programming and reprogramming occurs is connected both in the subject we talked about and in cancer biology. Thank you all very much, and I'm now glad to hand it off back to Dennis. Thanks for that uh, beautiful talk, Doug. And uh, thanks for all the good questions. We're going to have a 30-minute break now. And when we return, uh, Nadia Rosenthal is going to close our series. And she's going to talk about um, exploring the relationship between stem cell potency and the natural process of aging, and whether it's possible to turn back our biological clocks. Mm -hmm.